So today I wanted to do a sort of uh, interesting uh, look at something. I was recently watching a uh, review of Bioshock, or more of a discussion of Bioshock. And um, it just got me thinking about uh, when I studied a lot of objectivist philosophy based on Ayn Rand's works. Um, and how it relates to Bioshock, but just more in general, like what people typically get wrong about it. And um, so today I'm going to be talking about what people typically get wrong about Ayn Rand's philosophy and objectivism. Um, so I discovered objectivism through playing Bioshock, actually. Um, I had read some reviews after the game. It was a game that I just instantly fell in love with. And it captured my imagination, and it was uh, it was really kind of a watershed experience for me in terms of gaming. Um, and after reading some reviews, uh, talking about the game and everything, I kept hearing you know this uh, this name Ayn Rand being bandied about, and it's a name I was familiar with because I I loved books, and you know seeing her name on the bookshelf, I was always kind of intrigued. I love Art Deco, so they were doing a run of her material with this very Art Deco inspired, inspired cover, especially Atlas Shrugged, and so I was always intrigued, but I just never had, you know, the inclination to actually pick up a book and read it. But after uh, playing Bioshock, I uh, took it upon myself to, to, I picked up a copy of Atlas Shrugged, and I just um, decided to read it. And this was towards the tail end of high school, maybe first year of college, that I was I was reading all this stuff, and in early high school, I was definitely like a far left, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, liberal. But uh, as I learned more about political philosophy, I realized that uh, I had been sort of misled into what, you know, uh, the liberal mentality is and everything like that. See, one of my strongly held beliefs for a very long time throughout most of my life was that, um, you know, it's clear from studying history that, that large oppressive governments are bad news for the citizens, bad news for people. So um, I had always been sort of a, not anti-government like, you know, anarchist or anything like that, but just basically trying to reduce the size of government as much as possible and reduce their control over individual liberty, especially. And um, through the education system that I was brought up in, it was sort of alluded to that that was the, the quote-unquote liberal mentality. And we can get into all sorts of political definitions later, but the idea being that you're, you're on the left side of politics if you're more into individual liberty and, and um, um, you're afraid of government control. Um, upon studying more political theory and philosophy at the tail end of high school, I became aware that that's not really the case and in fact the opposite um and there's a whole other rabbit hole of stuff i could get into uh regarding that but basically i became more um sort of conservative um thinking libertarian thinking towards the tail end of high school and then of course after playing bioshock and reading ayn rand it was like wow there's a lot of stuff in this book that just is I've never heard anyone talk like this before. I've never heard anyone describe these issues with such clarity before. And um, you actually realize how rare it is to encounter a sort of individualistic, um, personal liberty, conserved government point of view, especially in literature um, and especially in philosophy. It, it's, it was very rare. You know, a lot of the stuff that we were reading in high school and early college, except for stuff from the Enlightenment and maybe the early... American Revolution was more kind of socialist in nature, you know, federalist in nature with a large centralized government and, and um, uh, not as concerned with individual liberties and, and not as concerned with uh, uh, personal wealth and stuff like that. And so I finished Atlas Shrugged. And then I went on to read some of her other novels, but where the meat of what she's really trying to say is, is not always in her fictional stuff, but she did a number of, uh, of uh, long essay form style of books, uh, kind of outlining her philosophy. And so 
I became sort of intimately familiar with a lot of the, the tenets of her philosophy through her fiction, but also primarily through her nonfiction and watching interviews and stuff like that with her. And one of the things that people really get wrong about her philosophy, and by the way, I'm not an objectivist, and I don't subscribe like 100% to the philosophy because we'll get into it, but basically um, it is a bit extreme and uh, uh, she was kind of a, an extreme, very eccentric personality and the philosophy is a bit extreme. And so um, it, it is sort of like a sort of fringe philosophy, but I have drawn a lot on a lot of the arguments and, and principles kind of dealt with in objectivist philosophy that have helped me sort of um, mold and model my, my personal philosophy, especially political philosophy on life. Um, one of the things that a lot of people get wrong about the objectivist philosophy is that it's all about, you know, screw you, I'm going to get mine. That... It's this very cutthroat mentality of, you know, as long as I'm doing what I want, as long as I get what I want, as long as I'm the one making the most money or getting the most value out of this transaction, whether it's a social transaction, a monetary transaction, an emotional transaction, a sexual transaction, as long as I'm getting the best deal, as long as I'm getting the most out of it, it doesn't matter who gets hurt, it doesn't matter um, who gets left in the dust, it screw you, I'm going to get mine. And the funny thing is, if you read her work, it could not be further from the truth. And I know this is going to... She, she and her philosophy are typically portrayed as telling people to just be absolutely as selfish as possible, absolutely as uncaring as possible, absolutely as uh, self-centered and... Um, unempathetic as possible in order to increase your standing in life to the best that you can at you know regardless of the expense to other people regardless of you know um the uh collateral or the or the, the fallout collateral damage or the fallout and um again this could not be further from the truth this is not accurate this is not what her philosophy talks about or deals with um See, that would, what would be called irrational self-interest. That's sort of the behavior of, of animals to some extent. That's, you know, it's a very animalistic, that's a very sort of quote-unquote savage um, pre-social contract way of looking at the world and way of dealing with things. And that's not at all what she talks about. And I know some of you may, if you're familiar with any of her work, may be thinking, well, what about that book, The Virtue of Selfishness? Isn't that exactly the opposite of what you're saying? The very title of the book. What I love about that piece of work is that one of the first sentences, at like or first paragraphs in the entire book says, you know, if you couldn't get past the title of this book, or if you have gotten past the title of this book, your mind may be open enough to kind of accept what I'm about to talk about. But if you couldn't, then, you know, you're not going to be keeping enough of an open mindset to understand what I'm talking about. And so what she talks about in The Virtue of Selfishness is the virtue of rational self-interest. It's very different than our everyday notion of selfishness. And one of the th main things that I learned from reading her work and, and watching her interviews and everything like that is the biggest thing that you, the first thing you need to do when you're having a debate or some sort of political or philosophical discussion with someone, first thing that you need to do is sit down and define your terms. And what does selfishness mean, you know, to her? What What is this political philosophy? What are the tenets of this political philosophy? What are the, what, you know, when we say this specific term, what, what specifically are we referring to? And if you can both agree on those terms, then you may be able, be able to actually have a stimulating discussion that may re lead to some sort of resolution or conclusion or something right but if you don't then two people are going to be arguing from different sides not really understanding what the other person is saying and it's just going to turn into what i think a lot of modern day political discourse has turned into which is just a cluster you know just absolute anarchy and so she goes on to say like 
yes, the, the title of this book is meant to be sort of inflammatory and meant to be sort of like almost clickbaity. You know, it's a very early version of like clickbait. It's supposed to catch your eye, catch your attention and get you to start thinking like what the who would write that? Why would why would selfishness? Because if our our daily perception of selfishness is to kind of screw you, get mine, why would that be a virtue? And that's not what she's talking about at all. What she's talking about is rational self-interest, that we should all be concerned with our own happiness, the quality of our own lives, you know, our finances, our individual liberties, but rationally, right? I think a great example would be like, well, you know, if you have an opportunity to take advantage of your friend, right? And it's going to cost, I mean, you're going to make a lot of money off of it. But it's probably going to cost a friendship if they find that you did to them. A lot of people would say like, well, based on Ayn Rand's virtue of selfishness, you should just do it because whatever, you know, you fuck you, they'll, you'll get you'll get more money and they'll be screwed. And it's fine because you should just behave as selfishly as possible and just do whatever you want. That is not the case at all. Um, because that's not rational. That's not rational self-interest. It's not in your self-interest to betray the people that trust you and the people that love you and the people that you may love. That's not rational. It's completely irrational, immature, ridiculous behavior. But people engage in it and it causes a great deal of strife and unhappiness. And she says, no, no, you would never do something like sacrifice a, a meaningful friendship, you know. She also defines sacrifice as trading something of of lesser value for something of uh, sa giving up something that is worth more to you to something that is really worth less and um, she also discusses that you know money is especially when it comes to personal relationships if there's like real connection or real feeling there it's not something of greater value you don't want to give up a personal relationship for money money is simply a means to an end um, it is not the end in and of itself she says things like that as well you know, so money is not as, it, it, you know, there, you have to think about the real value of things in your life. And you have to behave rationally. So this whole idea of screw you, get mine doesn't really have any bearing in our philosophy. What it does have a bearing in is where people feel the need to make themselves suffer for other people or feel the need to put themselves into situations of extreme unhappiness because they think that it's their duty, they think that they're they're required to, you know, whatever. And so what she refers to altruism as is the what she calls man as the sacrificial animal. And what we're really getting at in the point here is that if you're to behave in a completely altruistic manner, anytime you have more money Anytime you have more wealth, not just money, but anytime you have more wealth, you know, it could be time, it could be resources, whatever, that are beyond your means, right, or beyond your needs, um, you have a social duty to seek out people with less than you and, and give them as much as you can, right? And while this is a very nice sentiment, what it means is that you can never really have any sort of sense of security, financial or otherwise, and you are constantly going to have to be looking at, you know, everyone and everything around you to, to, to basically, you're, you're, you're going to be constantly bleeding yourself endlessly because the need of everyone else around you may be somewhat endless in order to, to meet the requirements of that philosophy. And, um, this is not to say that charity is a bad thing, but it's to say that if you, uh, anytime you get more than you need, um, you immediately give it away to someone else, you may be left as the one in need overall, you know? Uh, and so this extends to uh, the way that altruism is this the way that she describes altruism and defines it the way that it's it's expressed um politically usually is that you know you constantly i mean think about it how would you, would you really want to live like this would you really want to live in a situation where you are constantly having to justify everything in your life that 
you possess that is beyond your basic needs, right? And that's a very dangerous place to be. Um, you know, speaking to, like, you know, if you were clicked on this video because you're interested in hearing about Bioshock and, and more of the philosophy that it was involved in Bioshock, you know, um, you probably play video games, you probably like to play video games or things like television or even reading books, but let's be very honest, you know, if we're really talking about, you know, think about all of the all of the horrible things going on in the world, all of the famine, all of the, not famine, all of the, the starvation, all of the, the war, all of the poverty, and say, you know, in the grand scheme of things, do I really need television? Do I really need to play video games? Are these things that I need, you know? And, you know, no. And so if you're constantly having to justify the things that you like or the things that you do or the things that bring your life fulfillment and enjoyment based on need, it can basically be endless. I mean, as long as you have food and water and um, occasionally get some sleep, that yeah, your needs are being met. And so everything else that comes to you can be up to, uh, up for the taking by everyone else around you. If as long as they can demonstrate that they need it more than you or that they demonstrate that you have more than them and so politically what happens is as long as you can demonstrate that you need resources or or whatever more than the person next to you you will receive them and typically at the expense of that person and that is the danger of an altruistic society and it's kind of that idea of the the welfare culture of just taxing the hell out of the people around you to to pay for whatever not that you know everyone abuses welfare but unfortunately people do you know, and it's more beyond that, too, of, of, you know, you you can never try and find any happiness for yourself. You can never try and find, you know, like, you know, pursue your own interests, pursue your own, you know, passions and stuff like that. And I think a lot of people would recognize that a very strong tenet of most cultures is that it's OK for you to pursue your interests and your passions. And, you know, um, if you want to be an artist, if you want to be a businessman, if you want to be, you know, some sort of a creative type person, if you want to be um, whatever you want to do, you know, if you want to have hobbies, if you want to like live in a nicer house and everything like that, the fact that just because there are other people that don't have those same things completely justifies um, seizure of, of things that you may have worked hard for is actually quite criminal, you know. And that's really what her philosophy deals with. And her philosophy also deals with that you shouldn't feel any guilt, right? And if these things bother you enough that there are people who are going without and whatever, then by all means, you know, do something about it. Donate to charity. Start your own charity. Get out there and do something with your hands to help these people, you know, um, whatever you can do. But to develop large-scale political systems that seize people's life's work, their property, their finances, their resources, uh, to redistribute is theft. And that's really what it talks about. And also that, that we should carry around this immense guilt because others go without when it's not necessarily our fault, um, is, is what her philosophy deals with. And it, it is also not to be discompassionate to people that are less fortunate than you, right? That's not what the philosophy is about either. It's it's just about the fact that no one should be forced, you know, or feel this immense guilt to have to go do something. There's a difference between empathy and compassion and guilt. To be motivated to help those less fortunate around you purely out of guilt or purely out of uh, uh, forceful coercion by uh, the government is wrong, you know, and it's a messed up system. And there's, no, you know, and a lot of people would say, well, that's really messed up because you can't, you know, a lot of pe rich people just like to be misers with their wealth or, you know, and they're, they're not going to help anybody and they're not going to do whatever. And it's like, that's not really the case. I mean, Bill Gates is, I believe, still one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest man in the world. And he gave, what, over half of his money away to charity, to charitable works, to try and help with this, that, or the other thing. He refuses to give a big chunk of his money to his children so that they actually try and do something with themselves. I mean, you know, people have the individual intellectual, emotional uh, capacity to make smart, compassionate decisions with their resources, with their wealth, with their time, you know. Um, 
objectivism and what Ayn Rand talks about does not does not condemn charity. It does not fly in the face of charity or anything like that. But it it does say that it is dangerous politically and philosophically and wrong to force people um, to sacrifice their resources and wealth and, and what have you just because there is perceived need elsewhere. Because just as you trying to justify needing the the things that you have in your life the people trying to just just as that can be an endless you know bottomless pit of argument the same thing on the opposite side people can endlessly argue as to why they need what you have more than you do and so um that's what she talks about man as a sacrificial animal you have to constantly sacrifice yourself on the on the altar of 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 uh, uh, at the altar of the collective to be just because just by dint of the fact that people have less than you and you you know um you will never be able to call something yours you will never be able to work for something you know work hard for something and and achieve it and uh, maintain it and obtain it um before having to sacrifice it on that altar and that's really what she's talking about and so we must act in a rational self-interest um and rational self-interest is is very very difficult i mean you have to make a lot of sacrifices for rational self-interest you know if you just want to like go around and do whatever all day because it's not what you want to be doing as your selfish person well that's that's not rational self-interest if you you know have a family right but you don't really want to spend time taking care of your kids and you don't really want to spend time with your wife and you don't really want to like help out financially or anything like that and 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 you say well it's because you know i'm an objectivist and i'm this is my virtuous selfishness that's not rational self-interest i mean if those are people you actually care about if if you you know and you took on those responsibilities as well that's your responsibility and you needed to think about that before engaging you know before for taking on those obligations and responsibilities and that's yours now and so it's in your rational self-interest to do what you can to take care of those people and to do your duty um it's not you know especially if there's the love component there if you really care about the people around you you have yeah it's in your rational because you will hate yourself in the end you know that's how you think the path to happiness is going to be for you it's most likely in most people's cases it doesn't lead to happiness you know and happiness i think we would agree is is one of the goals of self-interest personal happiness and if those things aren't going to take you there you know that momentary pleasure that momentary uh illusion of happiness is not at the core of what rational self-interest is about right um But at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a sort of system where no one should be telling you what to do and everyone should be free to make their own choices. You know, maybe drugs and alcohol will work for someone to actually give them happiness. Maybe they have enough self-control to integrate that into their life, their life um, in a measured way so that there it is rational self-interest because it's not rationally, it's not deteriorating any part of their life significantly or any part that that matters enough to them um, to make a change and so they can rationally incorporate that and so it shouldn't be up to a collective of any other people to tell you that you shouldn't be doing something rational self-interest is also something we have to figure out for ourselves you know um so um that's really i think what a lot of people get wrong about her philosophy and so it can become a little bit because um a society of people behaving in their complete rational self-interest right um every single person would not necessarily devolve into the to the madness that occurred in uh, bioshock right in the story of bioshock um but there They're straying from the path or not understanding 
you know, the tenets of the philosophy that they claim to uphold is re really what led to a lot of, the, including, you know, the character Andrew Ryan himself, which led, which led to the downfall of the city, you know, people ha behaving in a non-rational way. Um, so it's kind of interesting because while an objective society would be like Bioshock with very few limits on, you know, what the government can tell you what to do, especially like a business and stuff like that, um, because another tenet of objectivism is this strong uh, individualistic kind of small government uh, uh, utopia where there are no limits to what a man is allowed to do by the collective, right? Um, to pursue his own fortune, pursue his own happiness. So you would actually have a society somewhat similar to Bioshock where there's not really anything off the limits, you know, um, things like prostitution might be legal, things like, you know, hardcore drugs might be legal. There would be very few limits on, on scientific um, uh, study and experimentation. Um, but, uh, so yeah, but ideally people would behave in their own rational self-interest. Um, I think another big tenet of objectivist philosophy and just sort of libertarian conservative philosophy in general is people need the freedom to make their own mistakes, you know. And so even if, you know, parts of the society of rapture, for example, are set up to be not conducive to people's rational self-interest, um, they still might exist because, you know, it's not the business proprietor's job or place to tell other people what they can and can't do. It's not the government's job or place to tell people what they can and can't do, even if they may be acting against their own rational self-interest. And um, they should be allowed to make those mistakes and their, their own choices. And there, there are some limits, you know, to, to objectivist philosophy. You know, ideally, your, your, your pursuit of happiness should never come at the expense of someone else's rights you know, um, it's someone else's life, it's someone else's, uh, property that, that, um, you, uh, take in a non, um, non-consensual way, someone's resources, someone's time, you know, so things like murder, slavery, uh, extortion, all of these things are go against and fly in the face of objectivist philosophy, which would also seem to fly in the face of the mentality of, screw you, I'm gonna get mine, you know, because, you're violating someone else's rights. You know, if you're trying to extort someone or, or swindle someone, you know, people would say like, oh, well, that's just objectivism. That's fine, you know, but it's not because, you know, you should have enough um, sense of the sort of moral right and wrong of the situation to say that, you know, if I'm, you know, if there are ways to make wealth without the expense of other people. And that's another thing that's sort of... Uh, a big argument in political philosophy, but just I think the the proof is in the pudding with modern society and especially the first world at how much technological advancement that we've had. People could say, yeah, it's at the expense of colonialism, but you know, colonialism existed for you know centuries and centuries before. We didn't see these kind of technological leaps and bounds until we started embracing a system where there was there were free markets, and the idea behind a free market is. Uh, wealth creation in that there is a transaction of goods or services between two parties in which both parties come away richer and a good example of that I'll give you a great example um, when I was uh, an undergrad my first year in graduate not graduate school obviously undergrad my first year of college I paid fifteen hundred dollars for an Apple laptop right with that Apple laptop, I learned how to do photo editing, I learned how to do video editing, I learned how to do basic digital photography, I learned how to do um, uh, Linux-based stuff, and I learned some basic coding, and I learned all of these things, right, with that computer. And with those skills, in addition to, you know, using it for getting through school and stuff, I was able to make more than the $1,500 back that I needed the computer to to develop those skills with or to yeah so um apple as a company made fifteen hundred dollars probably less than that you know profit margins but they got my fifteen hundred dollars which they needed more so they became wealthier from the transaction in a very um intrinsic financial 
perspective, and I became wealthier from the transaction because now I had a tool to help me develop skills that I didn't have before. And this tool would actually perform certain tasks for me that I couldn't do on my own. And so both parties came away richer, and this is what we call wealth creation, because both parties left the exchange wealthier, right? They had more value out of that transaction than they would have had they not engaged in it. And that's the whole idea behind wealth creation. And so in the objectivist philosophy and in a sort of objective kind of objectivist kind of rapture based or any sort of free market society that's really you know if if you're going to pursue your own rational self-interest i.e in this sense you know sort of pursuit of happiness making money it has to be in those kind of transactions where each party comes out wealthier than they did before with at least with a reasonably perceived um notion of wealthier than they did before you know even if you're selling something that may not help someone achieve their ultimate rational self-interest like alcohol or cigarettes or something like that at least in that exchange it's not a definite swindle because it's something that they want it's something that they um brings them some sort of happiness or joy or something like that and you're not stealing their money from them you're giving them a product and ideally it's of a of a of a high quality and so um yeah, that's the whole idea, you know. And if you if you find um, selling things like tobacco and alcohol, or whatever, morally objectionable to you, then it's not in your rational self interest to continue selling them. Because while you might be able to make good money for yourself and increase your standing in life to to pursue your other areas of happiness, there may be some sort of gnawing feeling at your soul that you do that so it's not rational con to continue doing stuff like that so this is again all tied into the philosophy you know if you're doing something that you feel is not good for other people and that bothers you then you shouldn't continue doing it in the objectivist philosophy it's not just like well fuck you i'll do whatever i want i'll get mine i'll get my money i mean i might be miserable it's like uh that movie um there will be blood you know he made all the money he ever wanted to make, but he made so many mistakes in his personal life that he was just this miserable alcoholic fiend um, when he finally got what he perceived that he wanted. Um, and that would fly in the face of rational self-interest. I mean, he had all the other areas of self-interest taken care of. You know, he had more money than he needed to, knew what to do with, more resources, um, you know more comfort the ability to pursue any of his hobbies that he didn't have time before before but he uh he neglected his soul and so there you go so um yeah that's just one of the the big things i think people get wrong about objectivist philosophy in fact you know when i first got into ayn rand i remember like kind of recommending the books to people around me and i had a number of friends who just kind of went off the deep end with the philosophy after they heard about it. And they just started doing, you know, like, screw you, I'm going to do whatever, and trying to cheat their employers out of money, and trying to, you know, and just doing tons of drugs and drinking all the time, and just, you know, just completely behaving in an absolute and and being like you know hurting friends and cheating people and everything because they thought oh well it's selfishness and selfishness is a virtue and there you go and of course now they're miserable and you know the truth of the matter is is that they while they were behaving selfishly they weren't behaving hell selfishly in a rational way you know um sacrificing your time and your money and your effort and and even some of your happiness you know for your child is not un you know it's not outside of the realm of rational self-interest because you've probably made a decision and the reason you're doing all these things is because you know that child and your love for them means more to you than your money or your time or whatever and so it's uh it's what you do and so to say like well i'm not gonna you know I need to be as greedy as possible. I need to keep as much as possible. That's not what it's about. And so, um, yeah, I just thought that that was an important uh, point to make. I would love to do more videos talking about some of Ayn Rand's philosophy. Um, and, and also to clarify, too, there are some good reasons that I'm not really an objectivist. Because um, objectivism sort of works at 
parts of objectivism sort of work with like personal tenets for you, right? Uh, personal ways in which to live your life, but they don't really work as a sort of societal philosophical construct. Because the problem is, in order to be living in that way, you have to be individualistic. You have to be, you know, have a certain sense of self-worth, a certain sense of honor, a certain sense of um, what you want to do and, and maybe even how to do it, right, with your life and how to get to where you want to go. And there's just a lot of people that aren't like that, you know. You may want to take responsibility for your life. You know, you don't want anyone giving you any handouts. You don't want, you want to take responsibility for your finances. You want to take responsibility for your property. You want to take responsibility for your uh, personal safety and security. Take responsibility for your health. And there's a lot of people that just don't want to live like that. You know, and it's actually at the core of a lot of modern political discourse. And I'm not saying there's necessarily anything wrong with that. There's a lot of different personality types, right? And that's just the nature of humanity. And you can't expect those kind of people to live in a sort of like an objectivist way. And the other thing is, is that every one of us goes through like an ebb of ebb and flow of emotions, depending on our and 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 reactions to the world around us based on our own uh, based on the external circumstances affecting our life, you know, so um, if you've had a run of really, really, really bad luck, you may not want to take 100% responsibility for everything in your life too. You may want, you know, like a helping hand. You may want uh, to not have, to, you may want like a little bit of uh, welfare. You may want some help with something. You may want, uh, you know, some debt forgiveness. You may want something like that. You know, you may hit a point, you know. Um, if you live in a really bad neighborhood, you know, a, sort of a, another tenet of like, you know, taking personal responsibility is like maybe making sure you, you know, maybe you know martial arts, maybe you keep pepper spray with you, maybe you keep, you know, maybe you carry a weapon with you to maintain your personal security. But if you live in a really, really bad neighborhood where the odds are just stacked against you, you may not want to do that on yourself. You may, you know, you may want the police to step in and get more involved because you just, you know, and, and, um, you know, or if the economy has a big fallout, even if you worked, you know, really hard in school and you got a really good job and everything and you made the right investments, but, you know, just something happened in the economy, something happened in the markets, everything crashed, you lost a ton of stuff, you know, or your health failed or something like that, you may want, like, a helping hand at that point. You may not find it reasonable to live in that sort of objectivist mindset anymore. And I think it's actually quite understandable, you know. And there's just a lot of people that, you know, don't have that same, it, having personal liberty and being individualistic and, and striking out on your own and trying to find your own place in the world is just not as important to them as just feeling secure and feeling like everything's going to be okay. And so I think at the core of a lot of modern political philosophy and a lot of modern political discourse is just, do you want the freedom to be able to succeed on your own, but also possibly fail on your own? Or do you want to sacrifice some or a big chunk of that freedom in order to have certain guarantees in life? And that's actually kind of a hard question to ask people because freedom is important to people, but a sense of security is also extremely important to people. And so you really have to decide what's more important to you and as i said depending on what's going on in your life or what has happened to you that may be a very different you know you may have very different answers at different times in your life under different circumstances ideally in the objectivist philosophy you would you would you know maintain you would stick to the principles and the tenets of the philosophy but it's way easier said than done you know um so you know um, and I think another thing at the core of politi modern political discourse that is ignored is that um, we can't just sit here, right, and say that, you know, Ayn Rand makes a lot of really, really great points. She makes a lot of stupid points, too, and she makes points that just make no sense, right, in some of her books. And that's why it's hard to follow, like, the philosophy strictly I think the closest that I come is basically saying if you look at just a lot of the sort of 
overall day-to-day -day sort of life philosophy of objectivism and some of the political philosophy and you take away a lot of the trappings that just are kind of a little extreme or don't make a lot of sense what you have is basically just libertarianism and i think that's sort of a tenet that a lot of us on the right who who are sort of thinking more deeply about some of these issues and stuff like that i think that's a lot of us where a lot of us fall we may call ourselves things like conservatives like that and stuff like that so that we're not confused with the libertarian party because that's the Libertarian Party is more of an entity that carries that name rather than strictly sticking to libertarian principles. In addition to the fact that, at least in the United States political system, it's not, it's not worth your time voting libertarian if you want to try and um, be constituent to a candidate who's actually going to have the opportunity to make the changes that you want or at least some of the changes that you want and so typically you'll just vote for one of the big two parties and that's why you might call yourself a conservative because you don't really fall you don't really like the republican party anymore you don't feel that they represent you you feel that they're they're really out of touch with their constituency but you're probably going to have to vote for them anyway because of the candidate that might be on their platform or might be running within their party and so that's where you kind of get people sort of Vague, like it's just this very vague definition. Oh, I'm a conservative, you know, um, because it could mean a lot of different things. But I think there's a lot of libertarians out there that might just, like myself, call themselves conservatives um, for these sort of reasons. Um, but what I was going to say is this, is that I think that one of the issues with political discourse today is that you cannot look at the opposite side and just say, that's fucking crazy right and i'm not talking about because it really comes down to two things like i said before you know do you want to do you want more freedom but less security or more security and less freedom and that's really what most of modern politics kind of boils down into you know um because most of the policies that we're really talking about now things get really muddied and bastardized when you start looking at actual political party platforms and the fact that people you know will have very sort of juxtaposed ideologies within their sort of um political philosophy but the main sort of um tenets of each quote-unquote side of the political spectrum really fall down into that more security and less freedom or more freedom and less security and um, one of the issues I think with modern political discourse is that we like to just look at the other side and say that's absolutely crazy that's never gonna work and one of the problems is because you know we have historical data to tell us things because we have economic data to tell us things because we have statistical data to tell us things it's very easy to sit there and collect a bunch of data and try and use that to fit your uh, use the facts to suit your uh, theory is that how it goes yeah use the facts to suit your theory you cherry pick the facts to suit your theory rather than developing a theory to suit the facts and the, I think the reason is is because how politics and modern economics, macro, micro, at the micro, macro levels, how they interact with each other along with social considerations, along with geographical considerations, along with um, temporal considerations, you know, historical considerations, everything like that. It's such a complex animal. It's such a complex problem that regardless of what stats or whatever or anything that you use to to justify your own political philosophy or your your adherence to your own political philosophy you're still just at the end of the day cherry picking your uh facts to suit your theory because there's no way we can really culminate all the information together to come up with a definitive conclusion on which political philosophy is the best or which mixture of political philosophies is the best you really can't and so unfortunately at the end of the day it comes down to a sort of faith-based decision you have to have faith in the principles that guide your philosophy right 
Um, that's not how everybody does politics, right? Some people just do politics based on like, what is the government going to promise me or promise to do that I want? Or what is a candidate going to promise me or promise? I, I understand that. But I think for the people that really get fervent about it and think about it, it's, it's based on belief because it has to be because nobody has all the answers and nobody has able, you know, it's almost impossible to collate all the data reliably to say, oh, <clears throat> well, based on the data, yeah. Conservative principles, conservative philosophy, and libertarianism is clearly the best thing ever, and it has no real faults and no real problems, and and uh, that's what should move society forward. Similarly, while I personally believe there's tons of you know, and I think I'm probably biased it, that the way I view the data, I think there's tons of data to suggest that um, socialism and and it, more left leaning and extreme left leaning policies end up hurting people, hurting economies, and, and stripping away uh, individual liberty, um, I have to admit that I don't have all the answers. I don't have, you know, I don't see every single tendril of the web that has made the entirety of what the socio-political animals and the geopolitical situation we're looking at right now in order to definitively say, yeah, no, there's nothing on the left or there's very few leftist ideas that make any sort of sense. You know, so um, it's a faith. Subscribing to a political philosophy is largely a faith-based decision because you don't have all the facts. You don't know everything. It's faith-based. You make a, f a, a decision and say these principles make the most sense to me, and I'm going to choose to believe in them. And that's why it's, you know, things always get to a fever pitch, um, when it comes to politics at certain periods of history because it's much like old religious wars people are arguing faith decisions <laughs> you know they're arguing things that can't necessarily be uh, quantitatively or quantifiably argued like you may be able to do in mathematics or science which even in those fields there's lots of wiggle room for for misinterpretation and 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 inability to find any sort of quote-unquote absolute truth right um and so because it's these, these faith-based decisions that are there that, that can be very hard to sort of back up with real data to to have any sort of real strong uh empirical conviction in what you believe uh it, it ends up being a faith-based decision and so it's very much like a religious discussion um, or, again, a philosophical discussion. You know, much of philosophy is not quantifiable. Um, and it's all just about what you believe. And, and, and so if we don't at least understand when we're talking to other people that it's about a belief and that I could be wrong because we would hope that there's some sort of absolute truth out there as to what the best thing would be, then, you know... Um, you you have difficulty empathizing and understanding other people's points of view and, and vice versa. They won't understand your point of view or at least attempt to um, because they think that it's quantifiable. They think that it's there's there's an empirically right answer to modern day political discussion. And once you understand that there's not really necessarily a right answer and it all just comes with and, and to me, you know, I, I vote and I my philosophy my political leanings are based on belief in in a philosophy right they're based on principles and so i just you know when i make political decisions or say support certain political movements it's really just about how close are these to my principles compared to whatever else is on the market and um yeah that's that's really what I wanted to say about that. I know this kind of got off the rails to talk about some other stuff, but it, I think so this video really does sort of touch on what um, what people get wrong about Randian objectivism uh, primarily because they it, it, it's a little frustrating that they like to just boil it down into just screw you, I'm going to get mine, which, as I pointed out, could not be further from the truth. Um, I think the... Game Bioshock does a sort of okay uh, gives a sort of okay uh, example or shows that um, 
the fall of rapture was not necessarily due to the principles of the philosophy that founded it, but the complete betrayal of those principles by the people that were so, um, uh, had so much conviction in those principles, namely Andrew Ryan, you know, and also that in order for a society like that to work, everyone has to be operating under those principles. And the character of Frank Fontaine, I think, was a great example of how, you know, objectivism, objectivism is sort of a fine thing to sort of base some of your philosophy on and how you're going to behave yourself. But you can't rely on or expect other people to behave in the same manner, you know. Um, and so that's what really led to the downfall in the city in the game was um you can't expect people to adhere to that philosophy as well you know bioshock 2 talks about the fact that eventually communes of of impoverished citizens sprang up you know which when you read ayn rand's uh, atlas shrugged and you have john uh uh galt's gulch which rapture is really just an underwater version of galt's gulch um which is the city in the in the book where you know all the titans of industry and the best minds in the world are recruited to go kind of establish this sort of um, uh, town where everyone can just you know uh, endeavor endeavor in their particular area of expertise in their particular you know uh, enterprises and you know establish a life for themselves there very much like rapture um, and in Gold's Gulch everyone has money somehow. I guess everyone's building each other's houses and everyone just cleans their own house and stuff like that. There doesn't seem to be maids or anything like that, but uh, I don't know how realistic that is. You know, I think Rapture gave a much better example of how, you know, those kind of jobs in that socioeconomic class would still eventually sort of pop, crop up. And then also that, um, that when things start to go south, it's sticking to principles you know, as sort of rigid as some of the principles in objectivism become, people's principles go out the window when, when shit hits the fan, you know, um, and so I think that's another thing that the game was about, just kind of the human condition, um, in the face of a utopia, um, and I don't think it was necessarily a, a real critique of Randian objectivism, but I do sort of feel like they got some of it wrong, but then I also don't, you know, Andrew Ryan has some good speeches that really kind of like, you know, empower you and be like, yeah, yeah, that, that sounds awesome, you know, and of course the idea of a random objectivist society sort of sounds good, I mean, yeah, you're gonna have to work your butt off and everything, but there's an incredible sense of like honor and, and self, uh, self-reliance and, and, and everything that I think is attractive to a lot of us that we would say, yeah, you know, I would be willing to work and I would be really willing to, to push myself and I would be w willing to um, endure some of the rougher edges of a society like that in order to live in a society of people who share my sort of beliefs and can be counted on to behave within the confines of that philosophy. But... Um, of course, that's basically what a, that's the whole problem with the utopia, you know, is that uh, um, human beings cannot, you, you can't expect everyone to share that and, and, and continue to act like that consistently all the time. You can't even expect yourself to behave consistently all the time. That's why I think the character of Andrew Ryan is very interesting because he was so convinced by these beliefs. But once things got kind of out of hand in Rapture, he completely abandoned those principles to, um, in order to save his city. <clears throat> even even a character with as much uh, discipline and as much principle and as much conviction as him was was capable of betraying his principles in um, a moment of need. So yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. I'd also really like to do at some point. Um, a real look at the games. Uh, the reason I did this as a separate video was I was actually sort of writing a script for a look at Bioshock, and I started to go on this whole diatribe about my issues with representations of Randian objectivism in uh, in pop culture and just in discussions in general. And so um, 
I wanted to kind of get all these thoughts and ideas out there before doing that. But yeah, um, hopefully I'll be doing uh, kind of a retrospective on the Bioshock and Shock series. Um, how they advanced, well, how they exist as sort of immersive sims and how they advanced um, gameplay narrative and, and all the things that were so unique about those games, as well as at least for Bioshock Infinite talking about how it's a complete departure from the the gameplay DNA of the Shock series and began to uh, it doubled down on the sort of what it, it seemed to think of as like the, the philosophical underpinnings of Bioshock 1's plot while abandoning the gameplay that really inspired the creation of Bioshock because System Shock 1 and System Shock 2, while they have fantastic stories and and, and um, things like that, and, and may even, you know, kind of look into some philosophy and stuff, they, they were primarily gameplay focused and their major contributions to games overall are largely the gameplay. Um, and Bioshock kind of did half and half it was half narrative contributions and half gameplay contributions or at least a continuity of the the um the dna of the shock series that made it so special but unfortunately with bioshock infinite there's this complete abandonment of the the, the underlying design philosophy behind immersive sims in favor of telling this kind of grandiose story that that Ken Levine wanted to tell, and so I'm going to talk about the the departure in that game, and uh, why I still think it's a fantastic game, but it's a terrible immersive sim. So that's what you have to look forward to soon. I would also like to talk about uh, Far Cry 2 in the near future, um, and if you have any questions or comments, you know, because I used to be really up on my my Ayn Rand and stuff. I, I read most of her stuff at one point, but it's been a really a long time. Um, so if you have any comments about your um, your own experience, you know, reading through some of her philosophy, or if you have, you know, claims you'd like to refute that I've made, you know, I'd be happy to have a discussion in the comments or anything. So uh, thank you for listening. I hope it's been um, educational. I hope it's been interesting. Um, and... Uh, Keep an eye out for more content on this channel.